believed if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now verse 3 says, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried, that he was buried and that he arose again the third day according to the scriptures, the death, burial, and resurrection. I would suggest to you, first of all, that the death of Christ is very important. The Bible says a great deal with regard to his, his coming death, his imminent death. His disciples were not really prepared for, for him to die, even though he had warned them and told them that this would be the, the way it would work out. His death is really central to our salvation. He died in our stead. He died in our place. And as you think about the death, burial, and resurrection, the resurrection, the resurrection proclaims that he is the Son of God. This chapter, this chapter on the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord, we call it the resurrection chapter. It is preached on frequently during the time that people look at, uh, think about Easter, though the Bible doesn't teach that we are to observe Easter as such. The Lord's Supper is observed every Lord's Day, and we remember the death of our Lord and His resurrection and all His suffering and all of these things. But the resurrection is certainly something that is fundamental, and it proclaims Him to be the Son of God. There are many, many miracles. And there are liberals that criti are critical of the miracles and try to explain them away. This great foundation miracle, if there was nothing else, would prove that he is indeed the Son of God. But when you think about it, the death, burial, and resurrection, his death is a very important part. His resurrection is a very important part. But somehow, the idea of his burial doesn't sound nearly as important as those other two. But I submit to you it is very important. And we need to understand that there, while there is a burial of Christ and while there is a burial for all of us, in his resurrection from the grave, there is the assurance and the hope that we too can be resurrected one day. It is something that is very important because of the idea of the empty tomb. Here is that empty tomb and it proclaims the resurrection of our Lord. He was buried and he arose. They, the garments were left folded there. They ran into the tomb. Peter ran in and John stood at the door and looked in and believed the Bible said. But the uh, there's something about the burial of our Lord is very important for us to understand. There were many people in the days of the New Testament that did not believe that Jesus really came in the flesh. They simply had an idea that flesh was something that was evil and that he couldn't have come in the flesh, that he was just uh, some kind of spirit or something. We're not to be raised just as spirits. The Bible teaches that we are to be raised bodily. There is that bodily resurrection and that our bodies will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We will have glorious bodies. You read the whole 15th chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians and it makes it very clear. There were those who are saying, how will we come forth? What kind of body will we have? Paul deals with that matter. But uh, what I wanted to say with regard to the Old Testament, 1 Corinthians, rather Ephesians 53 and verse 9 says, He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence neither was any deceit found in his mouth Jesus was associated with the wicked and with the and with the rich the rich of course in this case is Joseph of Arimathea that came and took his body and buried it when we talk about this matter, I, I, we're dealing with the minor characters. Preachers like to preach on Bible characters, and that's a wonderful way to teach a lesson. But there are a great number of minor characters, not minor in that they are unimportant, just that the Bible doesn't say very much about them. 
and this man is one of those. It is interesting to say that to show mention that this is one of the few things that has all four gospel accounts mentioning the the uh, thing that Joseph of Arimathea did in Matthew chapter 27, Luke Mark chapter 15, Luke chapter 23, and John chapter 19. All of these talk about Joseph of Arimathea and tell us various things with regard to him and uh, I, I believe it is very important for us to to uh, recognize the work that this good man did. God will raise bodily, not just the spirit. We will be transformed. The statement in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21 says, He will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed unto his glorious body according to the working by which he is able to sub do all things unto himself. Philippians 3.21 Our bodies will be changed. And another favorite passage of mine is found also in 1 John chapter, 1 John chapter 3 in verses 1 through, 1 through 2. He says, Behold what manner. John is, is saying to us, Here is something that is wonderful to look at you need to look at this and think about this. He says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. But look at verse 2 now. He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, except that we shall we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What kind of body are we going to have? John said he didn't know. Now there are a lot of religionists that will claim that they know. They've written books on the subject and well, that when you have a resurrected body, those that have no legs will have legs, and those who have no eyes will have eyes, and those, all of these things, and, and uh, may, uh, various ones claim to have come back from heaven and seen Jesus. Well, there's um, one that was caught up into heaven. Paul speaks of that, and he said he saw things that were unlawful. Ellen G. White said that she was caught up and she came back and told everybody about it. Somebody said, well, after all, she's a woman. The Lord knows she couldn't keep a, keep a secret. I shouldn't have said that, though, should I? <laughs> she came back and told everything she claimed to have, claimed to have seen. But uh, we don't know. Isn't it interesting that people came when Lazarus had died and been brought back from the dead? And there were more of them that wanted to see Lazarus than were they wanted to see Jesus, the scripture said. But what did he tell them about what he saw? Not a thing in the scripture. The Lord doesn't want us to, to know all about those things, or he would have revealed them to us. And so what John is saying is here, and he was one of those, of course, who saw Lazarus and talked to Lazarus and and saw so many of the people that were raised, three pe Jesus raised three people from the dead. But John says, he says, he doesn't know. Except that we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. So that's the kind of body that we need to look forward to. This whole body gets old and uh, decayed and doesn't work nearly as good as it did before. But we will have a wonderful, glorious body, according to the passage that we read just a moment ago, uh, to the effect that uh, we will be given this glorious body. Transform our lowly body, our vile body is what the book of uh, what King James says, our lowly body, and uh, it will be fashioned according to his glorious body. All right. Let's... Uh, Let's look at what it says with regard to Joseph of Arimathea here in the text. Now when even was come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself also became a disciple of Jesus. 
This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given him. Now, I want you to think about the courage that it took for this man who, first of all, he will be called a secret disciple. We'll look at that in just a moment. Why, why do you think he was a secret disciple? I think he was afraid to, to speak out. In fact, we'll look at the passage just in a few moments that says that there, there were many of the rulers of the Jews who believed on him, but they would not confess him lest what? Thus to be cast out of the synagogue. And that wasn't talking about taking them to the door and throwing them out. Being cast out of the synagogue was an effect excommunication. It would have, it certainly would have affected them socially, financially, and in every way among the Jewish people. They would have been outcast. So they were afraid of that. And uh, that were many of them. And that's what John says in John 12 with regard to it. I suspect he had in mind Joseph of Arimathea and also Nicodemus and probably a great number of others who believed on Jesus but would not confess him. They continued to be secret, secret disciples. Does the Lord want us to be secret disciples today? No, we need to have courage. We need to have the courage to speak up, to let people know, to let our light shine before men that they may glorify the Father which is in heaven. But we ought to be careful not to be too hard upon these individuals. How well did the disciples themselves stand up for what they believe when, when they came to take Jesus and to crucify him? What did they do? They ran every direction. A couple of them followed the Lord afar off. Peter said, I'll never deny you, Lord. And Jesus said, you're going to curse, you're going to swear, you're going to deny me three times. He did all of that, began to curse and swear and to say, I never knew the man before the cock would crow the next morning. So courage isn't always easy for the disciples, but, but we need to be courageous people to stand for, for what is right. As we think about this, this individual, it says that he was a rich man. Let's just think for a few moments, first of all, that uh, there are very few rich men in the Bible about which favorable statements are made. Think of the statement in Luke chapter 12 and verse 20 where Jesus talks about a man who had barns and full barns and crops in the field and all of that and said, I will... I will build greater barn. What did the Lord say to him? Thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. The Bible teaches that it is more difficult for a rich man to enter heaven than for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. You remember the story in the 16th chapter of the book of Luke of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man had a great amount of this world's goods. He didn't want the brothers coming to that terrible place. Uh, didn't matter. He, Abraham said, remember that in your lifetime, you had the good things and Lazarus the evil things. It was reversed at that time. And you could go on with a great many of these individuals that are called good men, but they're not rather rich men, but they're not they're not commended in many, many cases. Uh, the statement in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 9 says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in perdition and destruction. And then again we find him saying in James chapter 1, Come now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries has come upon you. Can a rich man go to heaven? Of course. The disciples, when Jesus said it was harder for a rich man, they thought rich men have all of the advantages. If a rich man can't get into heaven, who the, and they ask it that way, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, with God all things are possible. 
And there are today many men who use their money in an admirable way to advance the kingdom, to advance the cause of the Lord, to help mission work and other work that is a worthy work. And certainly we need to understand that to be the case. Now, Joseph of Arimathea. I want you to think with me about where it is. And I wish Jerusalem, Jerusalem would be off the corner down here on the, on the right side of that map. But there is Arimathea. And if you come across, you come to Joppa. Next week, we'll talk about a lady by the name of Dorcas, who was in Joppa, and Peter was called from Lydda. So those two places are on the map. He was called from Lydda over to Joppa, uh, and he raises Dorcas, or Tabitha, from the dead. But uh, here is Arimathea. It's not that awfully far, not that far from Jerusalem. And it's interesting that this man, they would distinguish, there were lots of Josephs, so they would distinguish him as Joseph of Arimathea. It's obvious he had a great presence in Jerusalem because he had the, he was a member of the Sanhedrin and he had the, the tomb that was hewn out of rock there. But um, we find it saying, Let's see if I, did I finish that? No. Joseph had taken the body, wrapped it in clean linen, and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. That's what it says with regard to it in Matthew chapter 27. We'll have a picture of that kind of tomb there's evidence of them with the great stones that they roll over the, over the entrance. Uh, because he was a rich man, he had a tomb hewn out of rock that most people could not afford that kind of tomb. But uh, uh, here is a man who's using his wealth in a way that would be pleasing in the sight of God. But look what it says now in this passage that he was looking for the kingdom. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented unto their decision and deed. He was from Arimathea, city of the Jews, who himself also was waiting for the kingdom of God. Uh, the Sanhedrin was composed of about 70 men. Sometimes 70 to 72 different individuals were a part of the Sanhedrin. The, uh, the Jews had a tendency not to have much regard for democracy, for the will of the people, and they put the ruling of the places that they were, the day-to-day -day ruling in the hands of men who were rich and well-born and well-educated from good families, and it is apparent that, that uh, the, the Romans would uh, have selected the Sanhedrin, which was a body of the Jews, the, ruler, the, uh, gov the uh, body that would make decisions with regard to trials and things of that nature. And so uh, it says here, now behold, he was, this man was a member, a Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. So... It, it doesn't even mention, incidentally, two of these accounts that speak of Joseph of Arimathea do not mention the fact that he was a rich man. They emphasize that he is a good and just man and the kind of things that he did, but they don't, they don't mention it from that kind of standpoint. But obviously the Romans uh, respected him. This gave him uh, the ability to walk in before Pilate and to make this kind of request, and I believe it's because of the kind of man he was and his wealth and his position that Pilate would give him. No ordinary individual could have just walked in and asked Pilate for that and received it. But uh, he received the body of Jesus, and then he and uh, Nicodemus. In just a moment, we'll get down to that in the, uh, in the next part of this, that he and Nicodemus uh, the ones who come to to, anoth uh, to prepare the body of Jesus for its burial. This is a, a thing on the part of both of them. 
that took a great deal of courage. You stop and think about it. They had been secret disciples. I, I, I say that because the Bible says that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Everybody says, why did he come by night? And some will say, well, maybe he worked during the daytime. Maybe he was busy during the daytime. I suspect that uh, it's the same kind of thing, that he, uh, he came because he knew the attitude of the Jews and he did not want it to be well known that he was a disciple. And they would later accuse him. They say, are you one of his disciples also? If he had made it for three and a half years plain that he was a disciple of Jesus, the Jews wouldn't have asked him that, that kind of question. But these two individuals, prominent and uh, rich and uh, members of the council, apparently in both cases, uh, were secret disciples of the Lord. Uh, he came and asked for the body of Christ, took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in the, a tomb that was hewn out of rock uh, where no one had lain before. There's an important point in this. If somebody had lain in that tomb before, if somebody's body had been there before and there was a scrap of bone that could have been found there in the tomb later, then they would have said, well, he didn't really raise. There's part of his body there in the tomb at, at this time. No one had lain in that tomb. And that's this, I just put this picture in. There are two tombs in Jerusalem that that there are those who claim these were, the, these were the tomb that Jesus was buried in. This is called the garden tomb. The other one's called, uh, it's in the uh, church of the Ascension, uh, 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 rather, uh, let's see. Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Church of the Garden Tomb. And there's no, there's no way of proving that either one of them, that either one of them is the place where Jesus was buried. But this is a tomb chiseled out of rock. And this is the kind of stone that would have probably been uh, there. You remember what the women said on the, upon coming to uh, early on the first day of the week to anoint the body of Jesus? They said, who will roll the stone away? That's a pretty good sized stone, isn't it? When they got there, they didn't have to worry about it. The angels had removed the stone. Jesus was gone. And uh, they, they didn't have to be concerned about that. They were concerned about where did Jesus go and what happened to him. But that gives you an idea of the kind of situation. I, I want you to understand what they did also. They would put a body in a tomb like this, and they would, while they didn't embalm it, they let it decay. And uh, finally, when it had gone to nothing, there was nothing there but bones, then they would gather up the bones, and they would use the grave over and over and over again. I remember a few years ago, the... Um, at St. Catherine's in the southern part of the Bible land, down toward the, uh, they, uh, they showed a picture of the bones of monks at St. Catherine's. And that's a lot of monks, isn't it? Uh, that, that's a better picture of it. I didn't show you this. Do what now? Okay. Okay. Anyway, it, um, it's a different situation than what we have. They would use the, same, use the same tomb over and over and over again. But in this particular place, no one had ever been in that tomb. And, uh, and Jesus is placed there. Uh, no one had ever lain there. Okay, I'll let, move on now to the other account. As we talk about the... Uh, Back that he was a secret disciple. After this, this is from John, the Gospel of John. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, 
who at the first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds, and they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen and the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. This must have been a very sad occasion for these individuals. They had hoped that Jesus would, would restore the kingdom to Israel. How do I know this is the case? That's what the disciples himself. You remember on the road to Arimathea, they were talking among themselves and they were sad and Jesus joined themselves, but they were, their eyes were holy. And uh, they said to him when he asked questions about, are you but a stranger that you don't know about the things that have happened, that how that uh, Jesus and they had hoped that he was the, that he was the Messiah. And then Jesus opened the scriptures and beginning with the Genesis account, he explained to them all of the prophecies of the Old Testament with regard to him. And you remember what they said? They said, how our hearts burn within us when uh, he opened the scriptures to us. I, uh, there are a lot of sermons in the scripture. Paul's great sermon at Mars Hill, Jesus' great Sermon on the Mount and other accounts that uh, are given, Stephen's marvelous sermon. But I suspect I would rather have heard Jesus explain all of the scriptures from Moses until the time of uh, the resurrection. I would love to have heard that description. Anyway, they took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen, and this is the, the way they did it. You remember how when, when Lazarus came forth from the grave. What did they say? Jesus said, loose him and let him go. In other words, there is the binding up of the body. Someone needed to have loosed him. But in this particular case, uh, they fixed Jesus that kind of way. Now in verse 41 it says, now the place where he was crucified was a garden and the garden was a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. We're very close to the time of the, of the Passover. What did they come to do to Jesus because it was right before the Passover? They were going to break his legs. But the scripture had stated that no bone would be broken the prophecy no bone would be broken and he was already dead he came, they came to the thieves and uh, it was a different situation but they uh, what did they do to Jesus In John 19 35 one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith there came out blood and water Jesus was already was already dead Let's talk about the applications, perhaps, that we can think of in this particular case. During 2,000 years, 2,000 years from the time of Abraham, from the call of Abraham, until Mary gave birth to Jesus, God prepared the people of Israel. He gave them the law and the prophets. Over and over in his, his anger and in his patience, there were the ups and downs. They were carried away into captivity. They were persecuted. They were restored. God blessed them. And, but over and over again, God had sent the prophets. He had given them all of this. They had tremendous blessings. In fact, Paul would ask in Romans, what advantage is it then to be a Jew? And he said, much in every way. Much in every way. They had been greatly blessed. But think about that now. Because their blessings were so great, the sentence against them was also a severe sentence. We find Jesus saying, He came to His own, or saying here in John 1 11, by inspiration, He came to His own, and His own received Him not. That's one of the saddest statements in the Scripture, but it's true. And it's still true today with people who claim to claim to be Christians in many cases they don't really receive him. Jesus said, why call you me Lord, Lord and do not the things that I say? 
the example of these early disciples and the unfaithfulness of many along the way should not surprise us. But the scripture said the common people heard him gladly. Why did the rulers and the influential Jews reject Jesus? The Pharisees rejected Jesus by saying, have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? Think about that. Have any of the Pharisees or the rulers of the people believed on him? Well, here are a couple. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, secret disciples. God doesn't want people to be secret disciples. But what about Paul? He didn't believe, but when he did believe, did he become a secret disciple? Oh, boy. Anything from that. Paul came in immediately beginning to preach and to teach the Word of God powerfully. The gospel was given to him by revelation. He went away into Arabia and came back, and then we find him going on three missionary journeys and a journey to, to Jerome, which also was a missionary journey, really, because wherever he was to the day of his death, he was one who was a powerful, powerful advocate. Now, I'd, I'd like to know what happened to Joseph of Arimathea. John simply records that one statement that he was a, he was a good man and all of that, but he was a secret disciple. He was a disciple. There are all kinds of disciples. You know that that's the kind of thing that we have today also. There are all kinds of disciples. Jesus said to one, the script called him a disciple, uh, this individual who was a disciple who said, Lord, let me first go bury my uh, father and then I will come and follow thee. And Jesus said that a man who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. It's good that people were impressed by Jesus. He didn't want them to be secret disciples. He wanted them to, to be people who are willing to confess. What does it say with regard to the matter of confessing Jesus? He said in Matthew chapter 10, 32 and 33, He said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before me, and him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before me, and him shall I deny before my Father which is in heaven. When Peter confessed, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, what did, what did Jesus say to him? Blessed art thou, Simon the son of Jonas. It's always blessed to confess Christ. Incidentally, are we just to confess him when we obey the gospel? No, all through our lives we are to confess him. We're to stand for what's right, not be a secret disciple. Uh, we, uh, we need to be courageous. We need to be faithful to the end. Well, we, uh, we're going to stop at this point unless you have something that you'd like to add to all of this. We're glad that Chad is here. I'll be preaching tonight. He'll preach today, and we're glad that he's here. Uh, and I hope you'll be back for...